to thank Chair Hag, the Metropolitan Council, for supporting Ramsey County's vision for a balanced regional transit system. We're very excited about the future. Please join me in welcoming to the podium Met Council Chair Susan Hag. Thank you so much, Jim, um, and thank you all for coming out on a snowy morning when I came early this morning to test the mics. There was no one in this room, and I thought, oh, it is going to be hard to have energy speaking to empty chairs. So um, I am grateful that y you have taken uh, a little time this morning. I promise you I am not going to speak for two hours, even though the program was noted as a two-hour program, but we wanted to give you a chance to uh, mingle with each other and uh, chat and get together. I'm really grateful to Ramsey County uh, for its vision uh, to uh, understand why this Union Depot is an important multimodal hub for the future of our region. And thank you, Commissioner McDonough, a friend and a colleague, and thanks to all of the Ramsey County commissioners that kind of went out on a limb uh, originally to get this uh, depot going and to all the many partners who helped make it possible. You know, today, as we're focusing on the future of transit, there really is just no better place to be than this beautiful building. Just think in 1923, when travelers came through here with newspapers tucked under their arms, did they ever imagine the fast-paced life that we have today? Where our bus riders, our train riders have got their laptops in their bags, they've got their cell phones in their pockets, and they are getting 24-hour news minute to minute. We're living in such a fast-paced world and transit is changing and the demand for transit is changing because of the fast pace that we're all living in here today. So as I think about those people uh, who had the foresight to think about the future, they probably couldn't have imagined this time. And I don't know that we'll be really able to imagine what 30 years will bring for us, but that's what our job is at the Met Council is to try to look out create a 30-year vision for our region. What foresight they had, I hope we'll have that same foresight as we think about what future generations will need, what the demands will be, and what life will be like. As Jim mentioned, um, we have Jefferson Line buses, we have 300 Metro Transit buses, and one year from this year, we are going to have the Central Quarter Green Line open, and that will be very exciting. So, I. Thank you. And speaking of the Green Line, I want to say a special shout out and a thank you to the 850 businesses along the Green Line. They've, they have been so patient um, during construction that has gone on for about two years now. I want to tell you that we're 89% uh, through construction, which is great. And a great thanks to the Green Line businesses. We have two of them here today who are doing the catering for us, uh, Sugar Rush and Golden's Deli. So make sure you get some treats. Those donuts are to be eaten. And thank you um, for um, sticking with us through this difficult construction period, and it's all going to get better soon. I really want to acknowledge the many Met Council members who are here today. I, if you would stand up and uh, face the crowd, uh, we have some of our 16 Met Council members here. They do a great job for us. Could you give them a round of applause? And I, I especially want to recognize um, the employees of the Metropolitan Council. I was so proud this past year uh, that the council member, the environmental services staff, and the Metro Transit staff uh, had worked so hard to develop an $8 million energy saving initiative across the council. They were given an award by Governor Dayton for continuous improvement. And I am proud to work at the Met Council. We have a lot of fantastic employees. You can never say thank you enough to the planners, the mechanics, the bus operators, the drivers, everyone that makes it possible for us to have a great quality of life in this region. So give a big round of applause for the people at the Met Council.
know, transit really matters to this region because it is the foundation for our regional economy. And our region is a leader. In this knowledge-based economy, this is a terrific place to live. We have exceptional rankings for educational attainment, brain power, innovation. Talent is what generates our region's economic growth. And every business depends on people, specifically the ability to attract and retain talent. And that's why the business community and the Met Council and others have teamed up to try to move our transit expansion sooner, faster, and farther. Businesses want to employ talented people. And we at the Met Council, we're in the business of moving people to work, to school, and to the many great amenities in this region. And transit isn't just about moving people efficiently. It also saves money. It saves money for businesses and employers, and it saves money, surely, for those employees. And it keeps traffic flowing on our highways. And it's not just about moving people, but it's the result of it. In a world where speed matters more and more and more, it helps free up the space on our interstate system to move goods quickly, and that saves money for businesses, and that saves money for consumers. So our transit system has to get going. We have to move even faster in this competition for jobs and economic growth. Just ask Greater MSP, the great work they've been doing advancing and marketing our region. I know Michael Langley's here from Greater MSP. I saw him. Michael, thank you. Uh, there you are. And all the great leaders of our business community who know that we need to function as one region, one community, when we tell this beautiful story about this metropolitan region. But you know what? Our transit system just really isn't keeping pace with the demands and the growth in the region. And that's a problem, because the metro region really is the engine that drives the state of Minnesota's economy. Do you know that our economy in this region is actually bigger than half of the state's economies in the United States? And do you know that our region is such a productive region, we have the top workforce participation rate here. People want to work here. We have just such a great culture about work and community. So our shared vision with the business community, with local elect elected officials, is for a really a red-hot regional economy. And that's the vision behind the leadership of the Itasca Project study, where they went out and said, gee, if we really study this, what is this return on investment if we actually built out this uh, transit system and we accelerated this development? And would it, would it make sense? Would it make a difference? And the the emphatic answer was yes, it'll make a big difference. And in fact, they found the benefits of investing in this system would offer a six to $10 billion return on investment. Now that is an ROI that actually stokes our economy and that's the type of investment we need for our region. The world is changing so quickly and our region is changing so quickly. Today, you know, Minnesotans want more transit. When I've been out uh, talking with local elected officials and community members throughout the region, mostly I hear from people, could I have more frequent transit? Could I have a line to my community and my neighborhood? So there's a lot of wants and desires, but you know what? In the next 10 to 30 years, it's gonna be a demand. It's gonna be an expectation. It's gonna be how life is um, lived. So let's talk about the young adults and what they want. They're the future for our region. They're the future growth for our economy. And they're a remarkable group of people. A recent survey of people who are 18 to 24, 46% of them said, I'd rather have access to the internet than to have a driver's license. Now that is a whole new world that we need to pay attention to. For many of us, the ability to get a head start on our workday and combine a shorter, stress-free commute while we have those wonderful devices that keep us logged in and linked in, that's just a no-brainer. And that's one reason why the Generation Y generation really isn't so interested in driver's license. They're interested in transit and mobility. 
So this means our traditional strategy of competing for workers and talent and economic growth, we have to really be smart about it. We are competing for workers who are entirely mobile. They can live wherever they want to do their job. So workers can choose a region, a city to live in, and they're going to choose those based on the quality of life and the amenities. And one of the things they're going to look for is whether when they step outside their doorstep, they're going to have access to transit, to trains, to buses, so they can get where they want to go. So I really believe that a robust 21st century transit system is going to help us compete for jobs and be a great region for the future. The other way our region is changing is we've done our forecasts. Great news that we're going to grow by 900,000 people in the next 30 years. That's terrific news for us. But one of the challenges we're going to have is that we're going to double the senior population. So think about what seniors will want and need in terms of access to transit going forward. As we, as we work with people who provide services to seniors, what we hear is, yes, they want to locate next to transit so they can get to doctor's appointments, they can get, make social connections, and they don't have to drive a car. So our community is changing. We're also getting much more diverse as we go forward. So transit is a way to keep us connected and provide job opportunities for everyone throughout this region. So as we think about where we are, I think we're at a great point. I think we have exactly the right set of people, the right set of circumstances to advance this transit financing idea. So let's think of two scenarios. Let's look at the status quo. What is the status quo for transit financing? Well, I went back and did a little work. It's been unstable and unpredictable. Did some looking at how did we keep transit financing going for the last decade? Well, it was a series of fits and starts. Six times in the last 10 years, we had one-time gimmicks, we had stopgap measures, we had a shift, a state general fund dollars, and have them paid with property tax dollars. And it really didn't do much to grow our system. We were hardly able to fill the gaps and keep it stable. The unacceptable and um, unavoidable consequences of unpredictable and inadequate investments are pretty clear. Services that don't keep pace with demand, congestion that increases at a more rapid pace, and a lack of development because investors and developers in the market just don't know when and where the next transit way is going to be built. And when they don't know when and where and there's no certainty, they're not going to put their money on the table. So many of us in this room have been working on transit for a long time. And many of us remember all the many steps and hurdles that were necessary to cobble together the capital funding for the Green Line Central Quarter project. It was incredible work and a great um, heroic effort by so many people. You know, I first had my first conversation about the Central Quarter Light Rail Line 20 years ago. And I'm happy to say I'm going to be here next year when it opens. It's pretty darn exciting. Yay! <laughs> And you know, we've made great progress, and it's so exciting to see that light rail line open next year. But let's not wait another 20 years to open the next light rail line in this region. When we fall behind in our region, we lose out to our competitor regions. That federal share partnership it goes elsewhere. It goes to Dallas, it goes to Denver, it goes to Houston, Seattle, you name it. It's not coming here unless we get our act together on this transit financing long run. So let's think about a new scenario, because there is a new scenario that's possible today. I'm very proud to work for Governor Mark Dayton. Governor Dayton has proposed a budget that's fair, and it ends gimmicks and one-time fixes. He cares about the future and building for the future. He has proposed 
a budget with an additional $250 million annually for transit capital and operating. So this funding will be, used, will be raised through a quarter cent sales tax in the seven county metro area. And it will greatly accelerate the build out of our regional transit system and our transit ways. It will expand our local bus service, our express bus service. It'll allow us to build streetcars, rapid bus, LRT, and BRT. This is a significant investment in the infrastructure for this region, and we need to get on board to support it. You know, a recent survey that was led by the three regional chambers was pretty telling. A great thanks to the Minneapolis Chamber, the St. Paul Area Chamber, and the Twin West Chamber for really asking the tough questions. If you want transit, will you be willing to pay for it? What they found is there is broad support from Minnesotans to support a transit dedicated sales tax. In fact, nearly two thirds of Minnesotans said they would support raising revenue with a transit dedicated sales tax. And a metro wide sales tax is what our peer regions use. And there's a reason they do it makes sense. It keeps pace with demand, it grows with the population, and it's paid for by the people who benefit from the services, both those who live in the region and those people who visit the region. So what would it buy? If you haven't stopped by those two maps over there, you can see before and after. I hope you'll take a look at them. So just a couple of things to note. There should be something in there for everyone in this region. A 1% annual expansion of our base bus system. And that's for suburban transit providers and metro transit providers. There'd be bus rapid transit or LRT in the new gateway quarter in the East Metro, depending on what the local alternative op option is selected. There'd be the extension of the Southwest LRT quarter, the extension of that green line from St. Paul into Eden Prairie. Well, the list goes on. We'd be able to build the extension of the blue line, the Botno quarter up in the northern suburbs. We'd be able to expand BRT. Per, let's look at lines um, uh, on Highway 169 or 212 in the Southwest Metro. And we're so excited that we are going to open a Cedar Avenue BRT from Apple Valley to Hiawatha this year. A great thanks to all the Dakota County Commissioners and the CTIB who worked so hard on that project. <laughs> And we could open 12 additional arterial BRTs. So this is, a, this is really an investment in the future of our state and the future of our region. And everyone is a winner with this scenario. But you know, regional economic success is not just about building a transit line, as much as I do love those transit lines. <laughs> Um, I don't know if anyone here has ever been a Sunday school teacher. I was a Sunday school teacher for about 12 years. It's really a fun volunteer experience. You get the craziest questions you could ever possibly imagine that you cannot answer. And I'm going to tell you a little story. Uh, there was a little boy in Sunday school, and his teacher had just read the story of Jonah and the whale. And the teacher asked the class, well, what is the moral of the story, class? And the little boy shot his hand up, and he said, Swallowing people makes whales throw up. Well, not exactly. Um, and you know what? If we go around telling Minnesotans that the point of the governor's sales tax is to build more transit lines, then we've missed the mark just like this little boy. Transit expansion is a means to an end. The end is job growth. The end is economic prosperity. The end is the quality of the life in this region. It's ultimately about people. It's about where they're going to live and where they're going to work. We've already seen some remarkable success with development along our major transit ways. Along the blue line, the Hiawatha Light Rail Line, we've already seen 9,800 housing units built, far exceeding our expectations. 
along the green line, and we haven't opened it yet, there have been $1.2 billion in building permits pulled along that project line. That's the future that we can build in this region. And the Met Council has been a part of this as well. Uh, we uh, granted $25 million in transit-oriented development grants this past year. They've had a remarkable impact. We've had seen wonderful projects from across the region that will leverage private and public investment. And this is how we build the future of our region. Later this morning when I bring our panel up, I want to ask them to talk with you about economic development, how they see it, how it works for communities, how it works for housing, and how it works for our entire region. But I have an ask for all of you right now. We are at a pivotal moment in our transit system, in our trajectory of transportation for the region. I really want to thank the many, many partners who have helped get us to where we are today. And the first call of thank goes out to the county's Transit Improvement Board and all of the commissioners who serve on that board and all of the commissioners from the seven metro counties. Can we give them a great round of applause? <laughs> And in addition to those partners, there's the metro mayors, there's the metro cities, there's greater MSP, the ITASCA project, all the great business and nonprofit and public sector people who served on the governor's transportation finance advisory committee, our legislative leadership, our regional chambers, the countless community partners, the foundations who've really been over time telling this story about why this matters for our region. So today, I am asking you to get on board. If better express bus service is what you love and that's what's important for your community, we need you on board. And if streetcars are what you think is great for customers to access your businesses, then we need you on board. And if you would like to see light rail lines serve your neighborhood and community, please, we need you on board. And if you are tired of gimmicks and one-time fixes that keep our transit system afloat but never getting ahead, then we need you on board. And if you believe a broad-based, stable funding source that grows with demand is the kind of common sense solution that our region needs to ensure economic prosperity, we need you on board. You know what? There is enough seats here for everyone. And it if you're in Apple Valley or Anoka or Maplewood or Minnetonka or Stillwater or Shakopee, we need you on board to create this 21st century transit system. And whether you drive in the MinPass lane, ride share, drive your own car, get on a Metro Transit train or bus, we need you. We need all of you on board to tell this story. So, all aboard, let's get going. Um, at the Met Council this past year, we've been out in the community talking uh, with everyone about what kind of region do they want to see? What is it they want for their children and their grandchildren? We've had numerous community meetings. Our council members have been out, and you've all been out telling us what you want. It's been an exciting time, and next year we're going to be rolling out this Thrive MSP 2040 plan, which is our 30-year vision for what our community can be like here. So with that, we went out to the community and we asked them what they wanted, what kind of place is this to live in, and uh, I would invite our video people to roll our video. A place is a home uh, because people come together as a community, uh, because I know the people across the street, uh, because I know the people down the block. Home is a, it's, it's a way of life also. It's a love that you feel where you are, you know. I have family, you know, they visit me all the time. I just love the Twin Cities area. You know, I've traveled, I've been to a lot of other big cities, and there's just something about the feel and the people. And In terms of business in this area, we are exceptionally fortunate to have the headquarters of many national successful companies, members of the Fortune 100, even the Fortune 50 here in town. Well, we also have a very thriving small business community. 
That community also supports a very vibrant cultural area that focuses on arts and music and theater. So when you put all of that together, plus an educated workforce and a very strong work ethic, we have a pretty ideal situation. You, you feel like you're a part of something, that you're, you're, you're helping build it? You know, obviously the work that the council does around transit is, you know, really integral to uh, creating a future where we're not as dependent on oil and, um, you know, have a much more um, multifaceted way of, of helping people access the city. I like to take transit because it's just so easy and convenient. Like, I get a little nap in the morning on my way to work and on the way home I can check some emails and kind of wrap up work. Transit options for the people we serve are critical. Uh, the majority of the people served by Opportunity Partners do not own or operate their own vehicles. Central to our mission is helping people find work and finding that work out in the community. And without transportation uh, and without options there, we really, really put people at a disadvantage. I think that we have a really vibrant economy, but the issue that we've had is that we've had some, some gaps there in transportation. I think we had a world-class uh, transportation system, we could just make that, that community, the business community, um, and neighborhoods even better. I believe stable housing is important to achieve all of this because if you can know that you have a place to live all the time, you don't have to worry um, where you're going to sleep at night or where you're going to eat your next meal at. At least you know you have a roof over your head. It's important to have clean water and have our water clean because uh, we know that it goes back into the river, that we get our water from the river in Minneapolis here. And so we are always thinking about what's good for our health because we drink water, but also what's good for our environment too because this is where our kids play and swim. <laughs> my hopes and dreams for my family, my kids especially, is that they will never have to worry. I like them to have fair housing. I'd like them to have a decent living. We'd like to think that they're going to be living in um, in a region that's well with cleaner air and cleaner water with more options for them to travel around to ride their bikes to take the bus or take the train and um, more places to visit and learn about more people and cultures that aren't like them without really having to go that far just outside their doorsteps. My vision for Minneapolis-St. Paul metro area is a place where there's a really thriving local economy. Um, there's people from many different backgrounds who are coming together to uh, create a really like stable foundation going forward. My vision for 30 years from now is that it still retains a lot of what it has, you know, a lot of the green spaces and the parks. and but it's better. You know, we have more transit, more light rails coming down south and going east and going west. And but there are more parks and more bike trails and more walkways. I just don't think that there's any other better place. Like, no matter what, I think that my heart would always come home to Minnesota and to the Twin Cities. Thank you. <clears throat>today have all been involved in some different aspects of doing planning for development um, around this region in different parts of the region and in different ways that they've been engaging with the community. So I think it's really going to be fun to hear from them. I'm going to introduce them to you. Um, immediately to my left is Colleen Carey. Uh, she is the president of the Cornerstone Group. Uh, the Cornerstone Group is a, a real estate development and financial firm. Uh, Colleen has worked in this field for 30 years. They really have a holistic approach to real estate development. Uh, they have been working on um, some projects in um, uh, along the Central Quarter, as well as some really neat projects uh, in Richfield. And uh, Colleen has served on the Met Council's uh, Livable Communities Advisory Committee, so she's seen many of the grant applications that have come forward for uh, development over the port portion of this last year. And then next to um, Colleen is Asad Ali Wade. Um, Asad is the executive director of the New American Academy. The New American Academy is located uh, just on the border of Edina and Eden Prairie. Um, and it is a community development organization that serves the uh, Somali immigrant community. 
and Assad has been involved um, uh, and serves on the Southwest LRT Community Advisory Committee and has been involved in station area planning along the Golden Triangle Station uh, along the Southwest LRT corridor. He's, he's been a mathematics teacher before he founded New American Academy. And then next to uh, Assad is Paul Williams. Uh, Paul is the deputy mayor for the city of St. Paul. Paul serves on the Quarters of Opportunity Policy Board. Uh, he is responsible uh, for uh, many things in the city of St. Paul, initiatives on education and economic development and transit and sustainability and those pesky day-to-day -day operations. Um, he has been the Twin Cities uh, Executive Director of LISC. Uh, he served on philanthropic uh, uh, organizations and a number of community organizations throughout um, uh, his career. So um, I'm just going to ask, and I'll start with Paul and move on down the line, just kind of give me your um, general impression about uh, the importance of transit uh, as it relates to both the regional economy and then the local economy in St. Paul. Well, thanks, you, Sue, and, and thanks to the Met Council for, uh, 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 for just a lot of great work here, uh, certainly in the last uh, couple of years. I think um, we're very excited about um, all the different things that are really coming together. Um, next couple of years are going to be really the culmination of a lot of, uh, a lot of different uh, really positive uh, uh, developments, so we're really excited. Um, it, you know, for, for St. Paul, um, it, it's kind of twofold, I think, the, the, the critical linkage. Obviously, the development of the Green Line in particular is an economic development and a placemaking opportunity. Uh, the mayor said early on, he said, if, if, if all we do is build a $1 billion railroad line through the city and nothing else comes of that, we will have failed. And I think he's right about that. So obviously the opportunity for economic development in the city, the opportunity to bring some of our toughest neighborhoods uh, uh, to kind of create communities of opportunity in those places are all great opportunities and, and something that we see as really critical in terms of this investment. The other piece though is that it links us to the rest of the region. And so the option of being able to get out to Eden Prairie, the option for professors at the U of M to come into downtown St. Paul perhaps and live, uh, the connection between the state capital, uh, Minneapolis, Eden Prairie, and so forth, is, is really, uh, it's a linkage opportunity for us. And we've got folks in our neighborhoods who are thirsty to, uh, to get out and work and to find opportunity. And so it, it's, it's really a critical linkage for us. Assad, what, what's your experience? How, how do you see this? Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and the rest of the Metropolitan uh, Council members and all guests. Uh, transit development is very important to our community uh, in the southwest area of the Twin Cities. Uh, for example, it has a direct and indirect impact to our community. Number one, it creates more jobs. It will make a accessible to work. People, employee work, uh, who are going to find a job, a place that they shouldn't be go bef uh, before because of the the line, the LRT line in that area. It makes uh, business development for the low-income and immigrant community in that area. For example, uh, the people who work, since we get a Court of Opportunity grant and community engagement and outreach for this uh, transportation, the Southwest LRT project, we have been able to train 15 members of our community to be entrepreneurial uh, people. So three of them now, they already have their vision. They, they are within the reach of their goal to have their own businesses. One of them, he's going to employ 12 people from the neighborhood. So it creates a business opportunity and economic development within our community. And without this train, without this uh, transit system, we haven't been even able to dream about this. Uh, the second impact to our community, it will be, uh, we have a large number of youth who go to University of Minnesota, uh, to Hamlin, St. Thomas, Metropolitan Eastern University, or St. Mary. The universities, they're all located in this uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul. And our community have a large number of, uh, of households, like six, seven, eight, or nine. So maybe three or four of your kids are going to go to University of Minnesota or St. Thomas or Hamlin. It's very hard to get same schedule all of your kids to get one car. And you cannot afford to buy a five or four different cars, pay five different insurances 
or parking uh, fees. Uh, so this is going to impact in education also. So kids, they will be able to go uh, as their own schedule. It's much cheaper. It's more, is much safer to travel. The days like today, which the weather is very bad, you don't have to worry about kids driving all the way to downtown St. Paul or Minneapolis. They are able to get just to a train and, and go their education and came back with safely. Uh, it also saves money for the community because you know you don't have to pay all those traveling to Minneapolis and St. Paul to uh, uh, for gas. The other important thing is it connects to to other two cities, Eden Prairie and Edina. They are like island. It, they never had a good public uh, transit system before. There was in some southwest buses who goes on a schedule, maybe an hour or two hours, three hours, but this system that we have been working at this moment, they're going to be running in five or four years, and they're going to run every 30 minutes. So it connects Eden Prairie and Edina and St. Louis Park and Hopkins to Minneapolis and St. Paul. So communities, relatives, and friends, they are able to connect each other in, in, in an easier way. Thank you, and, and Colleen, from your perspective as a developer, um, what sorts of things are you thinking about and looking at as you're looking at development opportunities uh, associated with both transit ways and transit? Well, I think the thing that's most helpful about transit is what it allows us to become. It's not really about moving people, although that's technically what it does, but it creates this opportunity for us to have a competitive metropolitan region. And it creates, it creates jobs, it creates um, tax base, and in addition, at the same time, it creates a, a healthier planet and healthier people. And we can create a, a walkable, healthy region, which is what the demographic groups that you've been talking about are striving for. It's, I think, one of the most important things that we can do to create a strong region. And the beauty of it is that it has so many spin-off benefits. Well, great. I'm going to uh, ask a few follow-up questions. You know, Paul, um, talk with us a little bit about um, uh, some of the transit-oriented development projects that you've seen, what are the opportunities, um, what, uh, uh, what would we lose if we weren't connected to transit, and um, how do we make them work the best? How do we make them super successful? Well, the, um, there's a wide range of uh, private, nonprofit, other public uh, projects going on you know, along, uh, along the line. Um, you know, certainly, there, I, I think of things like the, the transit um, allows us to take advantage of perhaps like uh, transit-oriented uh, uh, mortgages, uh, where it, we're able to underwrite mortgages because we don't have to include the cost of the car. That's exactly what you're talking about in in the consideration of of the mortgage. Um, the 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 transit also allows us to uh, to reduce parking. Um, uh, requirements in some of those developments, thereby reducing the cost of the total project. So, so there's savings. If we don't make that transit investment, we continue to have to try to build these projects, and they, in effect, are, are more costly. So I, I think the kind of the opportunity cost is probably there on, on several fronts. Um, but, uh, you know, again, the, the different kinds of projects that I think we're starting to see, you know, again, just in, in uh, uh, on the Green Line, uh, the eastern end, uh, things like the Old Home Project, you know, a mixed use, a, a reuse of, a, of an older industrial building, exciting possibilities there for mixed income, mixed use development, a real placemaking opportunity that will also, I think, tie to the culture of the neighborhood, uh, strong African American history there, the strong uh, Southeast Asian history in those communities, and again, it's kind of a we're, we're seeing a real vibrancy in terms of culture that I think is a little bit akin to what you see in some of the other great cities of the country. You go to, to Chinatown in San Francisco and you just see the explosion of culture. That's, a, that's an economic asset in that community and I think those are the kinds of things that I, that I see uh, uh, may, being made possible through that transit investment. Asad, how about this one for you? Um, we know that the engineering phase now of um, the Southwest LRT line is probably going to be about two years. Um, how do you keep your community engaged in something that's two years away or maybe we won't open it until 2018? How do you keep people engaged in the vision for the future? Uh, thank you. 
we have a discussion. We created what we call Southwest Immigrant Council. It's a group of, of concerned members of our group that talks about how this Southwest LRT project is going to affect our community in terms of housing and jobs and economic development. One of the things that we would like to continue engaging is about the station, station is, uh, what they going to have in that specific, for example, the, uh, the Golden Triangle. We would like to see affordable or mixed income housing in that area, in that specific one. There are some stations that you cannot develop housing, but one of the major concern our community that we would like to be connected with the Metropolitan Council and the Southwest Project Team is to make sure that there will be a, some kind of affordable, large household kind of housing, like four bedrooms or three bedrooms, income housing, or, uh, mixed income uh, housing or affordable housing. So what we do is we, for, for the last one year and a half, we have been able to build the foundation of, of uh, engaging the community and, and telling the importance of, of, of having a voice within the decision making table. For example, we are one of the uh, CAC Community Advisory Committee for the Southwest. So we are there, we are a member of those people who are making the decisions. We tell our stories, our issues, and our obstacles and also our opportunities that we would like to see in this area. I, one good example I would like to tell you is, in our community historically, if you tell them like something in the future, like two years or three years, it's like 10 years from now. But you have to give them in a different way. You have to tell them, what about 2010 or 2009? If that was a long time ago? No, that was like yesterday. Then you explain to them then 2017 or 18, it will be like tomorrow. So we are creating a small group of uh, who are included youth, elders, included uh, uh, community leaders, business leaders within our community to be the focal leaders of this project to make sure they are engaged and be part of the process. Okay. And if I add one example, how this will be important to our community. Uh, there is a new family in Eden Prairie. They just came from Africa. They came through US government. Usually they give visas, families who have a medical issues that cannot be treated in Africa. So this child and his family came through that way. He had a very rare disease in the brain, very rare disease, like every million people, maybe like one person have it. She's new to the country, she cannot, she cannot drive, she doesn't have another relative who drive her back to, uh, to, the, to, to the specialty care. So what happened is the child goes to a neurology clinic in downtown, in Riverside, University of Minnesota Medical Center. He have to go there for routine checkup. He missed about three, different, three appointments. So when you miss appointments, it will be very difficult to have another appointment again because you know, the pattern of coming to the place is, is not on time. So those kind of problems which are very uh, severe health issues will be solved if we have this transit system in that area. So it also impacts to the community health not only the economic or housing or jobs, but also it will improve uh, members of our community to have a better health system. Thank you. Great. Um, Colleen, uh, you've been working on a, a really exciting project, I know, in the Prospect Park neighborhood and working closely with the neighborhood there. Um, talk with us a little bit about that and contrast that experience versus your um, experience with your Lindale Gardens project. That we all could, great projects. <laughs> <laughs> we could probably talk all day on both of those. An hour long program, <laughs> yeah, right. I know. My favorite two topics. <laughs> um, I think the thing that's most interesting to me about the Prospect Park project is what I see as the possibility for transit in our region, and that is this really super connectedness. You talked about it with kids, uh, young people wanting um, wanting internet connectivity over having a car. I think it speaks to the bigger need for connection and the way that we look for sites uh, is about how we can connect. And it's not just that there's a train, but that there's beautiful green space and, and cultural amenities, parks, and, and that there's connection to jobs and connection to people. And um, Prospect Park is a perfect example of a place where all this stuff kind of comes together. 
and we're able to uh, put together a plan for a neighborhood. Another important piece of our um, selection criteria really uh, is a neighborhood that has a vision. And Prospect Park does, and Richfield does for the Lindale Garden Center. And so when we look at opportunities for development, we're looking for places that have a vision and the political will to make something happen, places that want and offer the possibility for those kinds of connections that make a great place. Because that's what we're trying to do, is create a great place. It's not about a building, just like transit isn't really about the trains. It's about a livable metropolitan region. Great. Now I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit, Paul. Um, what do you, where do you think that next transitway development should go in the East Metro? Because <laughs> I know that's a big issue and people want to see some investment in the East Metro. Uh, yeah, that is on the spot. Um, <laughs> well, I, I think certainly all the work that's gone on along Gateway is, is really critical and that, that is probably our furthest, uh, where we are furthest along. Um, looking at the different options there I think is still um, in discussion. I mean, when you think about you know, the opportunity to connect all the, the vibrancy out in East Metro, uh, uh, Woodbury and Hudson even, you know, those are, those are significant portions of the metro area. So the opportunity to kind of connect that into the core and eventually over to Minneapolis um, is pretty, pretty significant. So I think we've got um, good work to do there and certainly linking metro state and some of the, the uh, businesses, what's going on up on the 3M site, the old 3M site, uh, that eventually is going to be a, a pretty significant um, business uh, development there as well. So again, those linkages are important. I think the second one where actually we've made some uh, really good progress, thanks uh, in part to the leadership of Councilmember Stark and uh, uh, Councilmember Thune, uh, discussion about uh, the Riverview corridor and connecting, kind of finally connecting that, tri that triangle uh, out to uh, uh, the airport, Mall of America, downtown St. Paul. Uh, again, I think that's an important one, whether that's on East or uh, West 7th or whether that's on Shepherd Road. Some combination there, I think that's the second big one. And then I, there's also, uh, you can tell I've been hanging out with politicians, um, you've also got a linkage down to, to Hastings. Uh, which I think is important, and, and perhaps some, some northeast extensions as well. But Riverview and I think Gateway are the two big ones. Great. So there is a vision for what we can build with this new uh, uh, dedicated uh, sales tax for transit. It is real, and it is something that we can move forward on. Um, I want to just ask one more question of you, uh, Colleen. Can you just uh, tell us, you know, what are some of the other, you know, uh, visions and dreams that you have for our region? We had a nice video talking about a variety of issues, housing, uh, uh, access to parks and amenities, uh, concerns about quality of water. What are some of the other things you hear when you're out working with neighborhoods and communities? I think one of the things that I hear most often is that people are anxious for us to break down the silos between these different ideas and to be able to have a more holistic approach to how we think about things. And the Met Council has a particular job in our region and it doesn't go everywhere, but, it, uh, but we need to get outside, of, all of us need to get outside of our boxes and people are wanting us to weave together the different pieces of uh, really livable communities and not have a narrow view of it's about a train or it's about a park. It's about all that stuff and how we connect it and I think we've got a great opportunity to, to really recast the competitiveness of our region. Great. And Asad, tell us about uh, the dreams uh, of the families that you serve at New American Academy. What do they want for our region? What, what are their hopes and dreams for this community? Uh, about, I think about two months ago, we had a group from Metropolitan Council to our community, the MSP Thrive 2040. So we had like three different events. Uh, we bring youth, elders, and also uh, a a community leader is to come together and, 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 and visualize what they would like to see, what kind of neighborhoods they would like to see to live, what kind of schools, what kind of jobs they would like to have, or what kind of housing they, they want to have in the future. And the, the overall answer was to make sure to have a better school system for their kids. It was to have a better paying job, a, to have in the future and also a better transit system. One thing I would like to mention with you is that uh, Janetown in San Francisco, right? That's San Francisco. I used to live in San Jose, California and when I came to the United States, 
1995, the second month I started job from San Jose all the way across to uh, Oakland. So I used to get the train, the light rail. I, need, I didn't get uh, people to give me a ride. I haven't have someone who give me a ride to work or get me back. So the train was just coming like a mile away from where I live. So it was, I was only two months in the United States. It will take me to have a car a year. So without having that kind of public transportation, it will be very difficult for the new, new immigrants who, are, who bring energy and effort to really increase our economy to have opportunity to work. So what, what our community uh, would like to have is to have a better accessible uh, public transportation, housing, and jobs that they can support to their families. Well, I hope you'll give this wonderful panel a big round of applause. You know, these are the leaders that are our partners as we build out this transitway system. And I, I wanted you to hear their story so you could see um, just like the story about the little boy and the uh, whale that's the throw up. Um, is that really it's about the people. Uh, the transit system is, is really about the future and the hopes and dreams for people to go to work, to support their families, uh, and to be able to be connected uh, with their friends, their families, and their neighbors in this wonderful Twin Cities region. Thank you all so much for coming today. I really appreciate it. Please stop and get some more treats. Take those wonderful Green Line brochures. If you don't know where to stop on the Green Line, we got a brochure. There's a lot of great businesses that you should visit while you're here. Thank you for coming. Have a wonderful day.